covers an area of 21,038 km square, making it the second largest state in Peninsular Malaysia. It holds one of the famous rivers in history known as Perak River, which originates from the Titiwangsa Range Mountains and empties into the Straits of Malacca. Perak was estimated around 2.5 million people in 2017, with the vast majority of the Malays, followed by the Chinese and the Indians. History has it, that Sungai Perak derived its name, from the glimmering silver fish in the muddy water as discovered by Megaterois. Other versions on how Perak got its name, were, 1, the adoption of Bandahara turned Perak's name, and secondly, due to the tin ore, the state's hidden treasure, called Perak. The arrival of Islam into Malay archipelago, started in the 13th century, from the Arab. Persian and Indian traders who came to Malacca for trading activities, the strategic location of the Straits of Malacca, helped to create links among China, India and the Middle East. Parameswara, a Malay Hindu prince from Java landed on the west coast of Malaya and founded Malacca in 1403, he later married the princess of Pasai, from Sumatra and embraced Islam. His action had a major impact to his people who eventually reverted to religion, thus, this had ended the age of Hinduism and Buddhism during that period. Under the Malacca Sultanate's political reign, Islam has rapidly spread throughout the archipelago. With the spread of Islam to the neighboring regions, the Malay Peninsula states including Perak, had progressively implemented Islamic ruling in their respective administration system. It then began to plant its roots firmly in Perak starting from the minor territories, such as Dinding and Baruas. It was believed that Islam had spread through Perak River, via coastal states such as Malacca, Kelantan and Tiranganu, during the emergence of Baruas government in the early 15th century. Kuala Kangsa, is one of the districts of Perak. The name is derived from Kuala Karangseratus which means one short of hundred. It is then called as Kuala Kangsa, in short for Kuala Karangsa. Another source believed, to have a relation with the name of a tree, known as Porkok Kangsa. Kuala Kangsa, is known as the Royal City of Perak. It is located at the boundary of Sayong and approximately 48 kilometers from Ipoh. Kuala Kangsa has been Perak's royal seat since the 18th century, and witnessed many historic events. Kuala Kangsa was the place where the first rubber tree in Malaysia was planted by the British resident. The tree is still standing until today. Some of the famous heritage building in this royal city, are Malay College Kuala Kangsa, Madrasa Idrisiyah, Istana Idrisiyah, Barak Royal Museum, Gallery Sultan Aslan Shah. The major economy of Kuala Kangsa is agriculture with the plantation of rubber trees. Trading and business, is a norm. In such geographical area, the locals of Kuala Kangsa is very artistic in making. For example, Labu, Sayung, Keris, Turkad, and handicrafts made of rattan. These businesses still exist because Bukit Chandan is a royal town, so there is a demand from the local palaces which comes from the royals around Malaysia. Kuala Kangsa is also known as an educational hub. Tarian Gambus is believed to be one of the culture in Kuala Kangsa. Other than that, the famous food in Kuala Kangsa, which is termed Payak, Sendol, Laksa, and Ikan Kalibaka.
As for the royal tradition, Nabat, is a traditional orchestra that is played for the royals. Sultans bond with the people of Kuala Kangsar are very close. In the olden days, Sultan invited his people to come to the palace for dinner. The most awaited event would be Sultan's birthday celebration. The roads were bright spotlights and lights along the streets, and Masjid di Raja Obudia would be lighted up. Masjid di Raja Obudia, the center of the gathering. Sultan Mozaffar Shah I was the first king of Perak. In total Perak has been ruled by 35 sultans including the current sultan named as Sultan Nazreen Muiz Zuddin Sikh. Sultan Idris Morshid Ulazim Sikh was the 28th sultan of Perak. And, he was the reason of why Masjid Obudia was built. The administrative place of Perak changed multiple times throughout the history. It first started at Tana Abung in 1528 and ended up at Bukit Chandan. Bukit Chandan continues to be the official royal governance center in the palace called as Istana Iskandariya up until now. This proves the character of Sultan Idris I, who was an intelligent and far-sighted individual during his time. The current Perak now is using 99 Ondung Ondung Xotanan Malayu Perak. Unlike any other country in Malaysia, Perak does not implement the primogeniture system, where the firstborn son inherits the throne. Before the kin is appointed as the next sultan, he must first hold the position of Raja Raja Burgla. It starts off with Raja Kerchil Bongsu to Raja Kerchil. Durga. Then, to Rajika Chil Suolong, and finally to Rajika Chil Bursa. He would then be given the title of Raja Dehila and Raja Moda before being crowned as the Sultan of Perak. This group of Raja are also being called as Waris Nigari Staters. <laughs> empat orang eh, empat orang orang sempat dia pecah-pecah lah empat dan lapan orang orang pecah lapan lapan orang orang pecah enam belas dan lapan orang orang pecah enam belas enam belas orang lah kemudian orang pecah tiga puluh dua jadi ada tiga puluh dua enam belas lapan empat satu orang pecah there are four categories of Perak chiefs which demonstrates the ranking system of the Sultan's advisors and officers. The first one is, the four chiefs, Pembursa, Burempart. The eight chiefs, Pembursa, Burlapan. The sixteen chiefs, Pembursa, Arnamburlast. And the thirty-two chiefs, Pembursa, Tiga, Puludua. Masjid di Raja Ubudia is built under the name of faith and royalty, it serves various purposes to the people especially the people in Bukit Chandan, Kuala Kansar, Perak. History has it that Masjid di Raja Ubudia was built upon Sultan Idris Morshidul Azim Sehvau after he recovered from sick and received his treatment in Port Dixon. The word Ubudia is derived from an Arabic word which means self-surrender to Allah. Sultan Idris ordered Colonel Huxley to supervise the project and Mr. Arthur Hubback, the government architect from Public Work Department along together with Mr. Caulfield, the head engineer of Peyrock to do the plan and design of the mosque. In 1913, Sultan Idris Murshid al Azam laid the foundation stone. However, the construction of Masjid di Raja Ubudia is disrupted for a few years because of the damage caused by the elephants' battles between Kulop Chandan and Kulop Ganga that belongs to Sultan and Raja Chilan Abdullah. This has caused delay in the construction because the marble stone imported from Italy was damaged. 
Masjid Ubudiyah was officially launched by Sultan Abdul Jalil Nasiruddin Shah, the 29th Sultan replacing Sultan Idris Morshidul Azam Seh I who died in 1916. Year by year, the number of Jima kept increasing, causing the Masjid area to be extended in 1993, after two years of renovation. The Royal Masjid can occupy about 2,300 people in one time. Even though the building was renovated in 1993, the existing Moorish architecture style is still being preserved until today. The funeral ceremony of the royals is a tradition to acknowledge the death of the royal member. It will be held at Masjid di Raju Ubudia due to its location that is near to the Al Ghufran Mausoleum, where the deceased royal family is buried. The deceased will be carried to Al Ghufran Mausoleum accompanied with the sound of Nabat, the royal orchestra. The Nabat is usually played in ceremonies for the royal purposes, including funeral ceremony. The Nabat will be played at the gazebo situated in the mosque's compound. Most of the time, the masjid gets very packed with the jimu especially when Sultan Nazreen Muiz Zuddin Sir joins the congregational prayer at this royal masjid. The jima also includes the school students nearby especially from Madrasa Idris Sir. Masjid Ubudia also acts as a learning center. Many religious activities are conducted by the masjid such as Tadaras Al-Quran, Tazkira and teaching lessons for the community. During the Friday congregational prayer, a special kuliyah will be conducted for the women. The activities are intended for dakwa purposes to always give remind and spread the knowledge of Islam to the Imam. Being ranked as one of the most beautiful mosques in the world, Masjid di Raju Ubudia sometimes receives international visits by the tourists for its magnificent architecture and glorious past. Many visitors from all over the world such as Sweden, Germany and China came here to witness the splendid and tremendous architecture of the Masjid. As a result, Masjid di Raju Ubudia stands as one of the tourist attraction in Kuala Kangsar until today. The plan is symmetrical with its octagonal shaped plan. The main prayer hall acts as the central core of the Masjid followed by extended Anjung or porch. Even though Masjid di Raja Obudia borrowed the Western tradition style, particularly in the design and method of construction, the British architect had also considered integrating the design with the adaptations to the local climate. Masjid di Raja Obudia is made with strip foundation that is following the octagonal shape as a starter of the construction. The main eight interior columns are located at every corner of octagonal prayer hall. It is believed that eight columns refer to eight chiefs of Pembasar Jaja Hunt. The other 16 octagonal columns were constructed outside the main prayer hall as the turrets for the masjid. Reinforced concrete is used as wall. The placement of windows and doors at main prayer hall are made from wooden colored stained glass. The octagonal beams shape were constructed in the spill over area of the masjid, 
The base of these main minarets are inserted at the veranda. Next, the entrance columns were built, together with the concrete roof following with the arches. There are 145 columns that can be found in this masjid. These columns have strong influences of Moorish architecture. The arches were constructed in between each columns. The ring beams act as the structural element that primarily resists loads from the main dome. Reinforced concrete were used for the small domes. The buttresses were built and being supported by the arches below it. It composed of an arched structure that extends from the upper portion of a wall to a pier of great mass, in order to convey to the ground the lateral forces that push a wall outwards. The parapet's roof were covered through the upper level of the masjid. Later, the turrets were built which acted small tower on top of the masjid. The higher level of eight turrets connected to the other eight turrets through flying buttresses from bending. Around the first and second layer of the roof edges were decorated with concrete ornamentation as it appearance of the fleur-de-lis which can be found on British Crown. The main four minarets are built separately with the masjid as the minarets has its own support system. It provide a visual focal point and are traditionally used for the Muslim call to prayer. According to Toxiac, the minarets were built to represent the system Ampatli Patan, system for chiefs of Perak. These minarets reach up to 26.107 meters. The main dome's frameworks were constructed and later it was built with reinforced concrete material. The splendor of this masjid can be seen in the large onion-shaped dome that symbolizing the Masjid de Rajobadiyu as the royal masjid. There are several features which can be found in Masjid de Rajo Budia. These features show significant function and also give aesthetic value to the Masjid. They were originally constructed in 1917. Aesthetically, the Masjid inherits eclectic, with Moorish or Mughal Gothic as its primary architectural style. The main dome has a shape of an onion. It symbolizes as Sultan. The construction shows that reinforcement steel bar was embedded inside cast concrete of the dome to increase its tensile strength. Concrete is strong under compression, but has weak tensile strength. Reinforcement bar significantly increases the tensile strength of the structure. In 1969, the main concrete dome had damaged and so had changed to aluminium clad dome. There are four minarets which surrounds the main dome, which consists of base, shaft and gallery. It was usually used as a place where the muezzin announced the prayer call or the azan. This type of minaret has an octagonal base with a slender cylindrical body. The dome represent the highest hierarchy which is the sultan. Next, the four minarets symbolize the four chiefs of Perak. Proceed with the eight chiefs and sixteen chiefs. The minaret was plastered with six strips of rich marble tiles. The gallery of this minaret is adorned with eight column catris. Underneath the chatri is the cornice and below cornice. Corbels are arranged repetitively on the frieze and fleur de lis installed at the base of the minaret. Brackets were used as aesthetic purpose and were placed adjacent to the arch supported by the Doric order column. The styles of the windows were in Moorish architecture, where arched forms with geometric designs of timber frame are apparent as their features. These windows functioned for ventilation, lighting and aesthetic purpose. The stained glass window reduced heat by filtering the light which penetrated through the windows. During the old construction, the window which were placed on the top can be opened. The window can be swung by the hinge and back to its normal position. Now, the window has been sealed with the stained glass during the Sultan Aslan Shah time. 
After the installation of the air conditioner, the cola known as ablution pool was the only feature that has been demolished by architect Surya during the renovation work in 1994. Based from the interview, everyone had agreed on one thing which was that the cola was octagonal in shape. Masjid Obudia is the only masjid in the world that has buttresses as they are tend to be used in churches not masjid as were popular in the Europe, not in Asia. Buttress is a structure which projects against a wall to support or reinforce the height of a building. The buttresses in Masjid Obudia help to support the big, heavy, tall central dome. The concrete dome give too much load on the wall as it required the buttress to help distributing the load. There are total of 8 buttresses connected with the primary turret. Underneath every buttress, there are supporting arches constructed. Mihrab is a niche in the wall of mosque to indicate the Qiblat, which is the Kaaba direction the Muslims face when praying, in Masjid di Rajo Budia. Meanwhile, the mimbar is covered in carvings out of Kayujati through to book timbers technique. The top of the mihrab is adorned with geometric pattern using the relief technique. Finally, it was finished with a bulbous dome painted in shining gold color. There were also few dazzling golden cat calligraphies. One of them is a part of Quranic verses placed in front of the mihrab. One of the latest feature is the main prayer hall ceiling, which was installed in 2003. The design is influenced from the Uzbekistan. It derived from the geometrical shape, repeated eight times and later merged to form an octagonal shape. The middle and corner of the ceiling are the Mukhanas. The ceiling also exhibit the 99 names of Allah, carved and colored with gold plated. The materials for all columns of Masjid di Rajo Budia were made of prefabricated composite concrete. The structure of the Masjid can be strengthened by the number of columns used. Based on the observation, not all columns functioned as the structural element. Some of them served as decorative elements that enhance the Masjid style in architecture whereas some work as a supporting structure. Indo-Saracenic architecture style can be seen through the varieties of arches. The hybrid of Mughal, Moorish and Gothic architectural style were frequently used by the architect, A.B. Habak, in his buildings during the Malaysia's colonial period. Mass concrete was used for the ornamentation along the roof edges. The fleur de lis ornamentation does not support any load except itself. Nineteen seventeen marked the completion of Masjid di Rajo Budia. In nineteen sixty seven. The occurrence of the central dome got broken. The concrete dome was demolished and later on was replaced by the yellow aluminium cladding. Steel space frame is used to replace the structure of the dome to carry the load at the same time making the dome's structure stronger and stable. At this time, the other domes were painted with yellowish gold color, manifesting the element of royalty. In 1990, architect Surya was appointed by Parak Public Work Department to do some renovation. This is to cater more Jamara especially during Idul Fitri and Jumuad prayer. During this major renovation, vehicular drop-off porch is added for Sultan's access or in case of an emergency. Masjid di Raja Obudia has gone through many changes and renovation. But one thing remains the same. Its dual roles, as the driving force for the Islamic community development, as well as a significant place to hold pay rock royals functions and gathering with the public. A century has passed, but Masjid di Raja Obudia is still active in fulfilling its aim, and duty in spreading dakwa, by hosting many public and royal events, and activities, consequently, becoming the local community's gathering hub. Although, 
The design of Masjid di Raja Obudia has apparently adopted many international styles, its overall design still maintains the essences of the local culture and heritage values. This proves that, though the Masjid exerts some external influences, it has undoubtedly adapted and improved its architectural form by integrating the local philosophical values. In other words, the usage of borrowed architectural characters, styles and features have been improvised to create an apparent identity of its own. Thank you. 